Hello and welcome to the World of Optometry webinar. You are all very welcome wherever you are joining us from today. My name is Kenrick and I will be hosting today's webinar session. I am also joined by Samuel, who will be assisting me in today's presentation. Before we get started, it is important that we cover some general housekeeping. Please ensure that your cameras and mics remain off. This is to eliminate any background noise, which can cause feedback or noise disturbance to the speaker and other attendees. Please rename your electronic device with the name that you have registered with for the webinar. This is the name that will be used on your certificate of attendance. If your name on your device does not match the name that you have registered with, we will not be able to give the certificate of attendance. To receive the certificate of attendance, you will be required to stay for the duration of the webinar after which we will send you a simple review form, which you will fill out via email. Please post your questions in the chat box feature. You can do this at any time during the presentation and they will be answered at the end by the guest speaker. Please address your questions to the everybody option. Samuel will be able to assist you with any technical difficulties. So if you are experiencing any issues with sound, picture, please let us know in the chat box feature. Samuel may also contact you to rename your electronic device during the presentation if it is necessary. If you have any queries about getting your certificate of attendance and this process, Samuel will also be able to ensure that these inquiries are answered. Today's presentation will last between 35 and 45 minutes, followed by a Q and A session. I am delighted to present our guest speaker this evening, who is Dr. Josephine Sampson Brogan. Dr. Josephine Sampson Brogan is the first fellow of the British Contact Lens Association, BCLA, in the Middle East and Africa. She's also the first fellow of the BCLA in the Middle East and Philippines. She is an associate of the International Specialty Contact Lens Association, sorry, Society. ISCLS in the United Arab Emirates. She is both a registered nurse, a doctor of optometry, who has been practicing for 24 years, fitting and designing specialty contact lenses for irregular corneas and for dry eye patients. She also custom design and fits orthokeratology lenses, using it as one of the modalities to control the rapid progression of myopia in her patients. She is also a respected lecturer and speaker sharing her knowledge in medical conferences to the fellows practitioners in Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. She is currently practicing her ex expertise in clinical optometrist as a clinical optometrist, orthokeratologist, and a specialty contact lens practitioner. So without further ado, I will now pass you over to the speaker for the commencement of the session, Dr. Josephine Sampson Brogan, also known as Dr. Jules. Over to you, Doc. Thank you so much, Henry. Uh, that's a uh, very nice uh, welcome. Thank you so much. I feel humbled. So hopefully um, you can hear me very well. So yeah. as I was saying a while ago, so me and Henry, we were um, chatting before uh, we went online. And then I was saying, it's just so weird to give a lecture now I base on in front of the computer without seeing everyone so hopefully soon we'll be able to do this face to face so yeah so i just want to correct i'm the first fellow of um, bcla in the middle east i don't know about africa <laughs> okay. okay so yeah so um and my lecture is about orthokeratology and the title is easy as one two three so i would like to thank the world of optometry for inviting me tonight um the thing is you know like uh the i was telling the uh the team of um the world of optometry what i uh, prepared for today for you is a very basic uh orthokeratology practice um if you want to start or if you want to know about um orthokeratology so let's start Okay, so nowadays, um, what's happening whenever we open uh, social media or, uh, you know, everything that's being talked about medically, it's always about coronavirus, COVID, 
Okay, so the thing is, it's very timely that I was invited to do this lecture about ORF. Okay, why? What happened from last year, let's say around March until now, apart from flights being canceled, apart from us being stuck inside the um, house or home, also our patients were stuck inside the home. So what happened is that most of the students, they did online schooling, and then the parents, they did um you know they work from home and from here actually there's a lot of uh i don't know with you guys those who are working in the clinic or optical shop in the clinic where i work uh, what happened in the middle of pandemic we still are going to work you know like um the thing is although it's saying that it's only emergency that you can go in the clinic for us we still had to go to uh you know our clinic our our work why? Because the thing is, uh, working in a specialty field here where I am um, situated or I'm um, working, uh, there's a lot of patients with irregular cornea. So as um, can it mentioned, I uh, I design contact lenses. So half of my lungs breaks eye fits for kids. Half of my lungs design contact lenses for irregular corneas. So every day is like an emergency, even if in the middle of pandemic. So here you can see the children, they are stuck at home in their handheld devices um, almost 24-7 because um, online schooling happened. And then after school, uh, they are bored. They cannot go out. They cannot do the cycling. You know, we recommended before for um, short-sighted patients, let's say, to go more outdoors and play, but they cannot. So they ended up looking on their handheld device and computer for um, almost the whole day. Even with the parents, in uh, you know, like um, they had to work from home. So what's the result of this? So uh, what's happening is that uh, there's a lot of uh, dry eyes that happened. Um, you know, uh, and then uh, what else happened is that uh, I don't know if you know about 2020 when constantly looking in front of the computer, the kids, uh, as you will see later, I will discuss about what they found out. Uh, there was a study about those um, students or um, children who used handheld devices in the middle of pandemic. So um, there's an increase of myopia. Okay, so and then as well as when they started to go back let's say um started to go and um went in the offices the adults the children started to go back in the uh, schools here what happens when they come in the ITS room they have to wear a mask now we're all required to have a mask and then they always complain of their eyeglasses when they're wearing their eyeglasses you know that it fogs a lot when they're wearing it so um, with that, uh, we're always thinking of what the solution. To tell you honestly, I so I've been an optometrist for 24 years, right? So um, to tell you honestly, I have never um, seen as much patient ask about contact lenses as how I see them now because they're just so tired of their eyeglasses fogging up when um, they're wearing their masks, just like the picture here. So if you are as smart as one of my patients, so what he did is, um, you know, it kept on fogging. So what he did, he placed googly eyes on his mask and he told me that he was able to solve the problem. And it would be uh, nice if we can do this, you know, and recommend it to patients. But of course, unfortunately, they won't be able to see, right? So yeah, so um, one of the studies, uh, I'm sure you see it in your clinics as well, if you started to see patients um, now, uh, is that um, there's a lot, as I've said, uh, there's a lot of patients with dry eyes. And then I thought it's just here in the Middle East. It's just my patients that I'm seeing that even the kids are having um, dry eyes, uh, you know, in the middle of pandemic and then up until now. But there's a study that came out from University of Waterloo uh, last year. So um, what they found out is that um, they were saying that um, when we wear a mask, there's air coming out from, um, you know, towards the eye. It's like blowing a cup of coffee or tea again and again over the eye, even if you don't speak, even if you just breathe. So even our soft contact lens wearers, they're struggling nowadays because they're becoming contact lens intolerant. 
So um, as I was saying a while ago, with regards to um, myopia, we already know that, um, you know, the thing is I graduated in 96, you see. So we saw the surge of short-sightedness um, late 90s, early 2000. Um, when there was an increase of the short-sightedness in um, children. And then, um, yeah, unfortunately, we still blame um, Steve Jobs, even if he's dead, because um, ever since, uh, you know, he introduced a very beautiful computer, for those of you who are as old as me, you will remember this um, computer that has, like, um, colorful, um, you know, top. And then um, ever since that time, there was just, um, you know, that's the evolution where we started to have this handheld devices at the computer, and there was an increase in short-sightedness, uh, you know, like across the globe. So what they found, uh, so they did a study and, um, and then presented it in January 2021. So if you can see on this slide, um, what uh, they found out, let's say, uh, did the children, um, they did a study 2015 to 2019 compared to um, the prevalence of myopia in 2020 in the middle of pandemic when there was uh, more kids who were doing online schooling. Um, it's quite alarming because if you can see um, children age 6, um, from 5.7%, it shoot up to 21.5%, you know, in a prevalence of myopia. Seven years old from 16.2 to 26.2 and 27.7 to um, 37.2. So it's not just one, two, three percent, but a whooping number of percentage and increase in um, short sightedness. So um, thank you very much to the world of optometry for inviting me to give this lecture because um, hopefully we'll be able to help our patients through this. So with this in mind, you know, like dry eyes, contact lens intolerance, you know, for adults, um, children, um, seeing children when they go in your eye test room before the pandemic, they have, um, let's say, minus one, minus two, and then suddenly, um, you know, like when they come for a follow-up after uh, six months or even um, a year, uh, or nine months, you will see there's an increase in um, each length or elongation of the eyeball, myopia suddenly shoots up. So uh, what we found in our clinic is that there are more queries about um, orthokate. So patients are uh, getting in tune in, um, you know, like they're, it, it created awareness on what, what orthokate is. So even colleagues from across the globe were asking because before they're like, oh, okay, it's fine. Even the ones on pediatric optometrists, they're okay. They refer patients for um, ortho -key. But now they are very interested because of um, what's happening across the globe and what showed up after the pandemic. So a lot of our patients, I, I don't know if um, some of you are working in opticals as well. Sometimes um, patients will come to you and will ask you about it. So hopefully the uh, session for tonight, um, tonight because it's uh, 5 uh, p.m. Uh, past 5 here in um, Dubai, uh, this tonight, this morning and afternoon, okay, wherever you are across the globe, hopefully it will either create awareness on you. And if a patient comes to you in, let's say, an optical or a clinic, although you're not planning of um, practicing orthokay, at least you will have an idea, isn't it? So when somebody asks you. So um, the patients, because of Dr. Google, they can easily, um, you know, just type orthokay and then they will get an idea. But most of the ideas when a patient comes in your eye test room is, uh, is that, okay, orthokay, they know that uh, these lenses, um, you wear it um, before you go to sleep in the morning. When you wake up, you remove it, and then you don't need glasses or contact lens in daytime. But that's it, okay? So hopefully, we'll be able to teach you or tell you today what is it for. And, um, you know, like if you want to start uh, practicing it as well, hopefully, we'll be able to, you know, like inspire you. Okay, so our learning objectives for today, um, we are expecting the attendants to be able to determine uh, which patients are suitable for orthokay lenses and who will benefit uh, the most. And then we want to learn and apply the basics of fitting and dispensing orthokay lenses. Because uh, what you will encounter at times as well is that, um, I don't know, um, in other countries, but where we are in the uh, in UAE, it's a very transient country. You see, so people come here, um, works, uh, you know, parents of uh, the 
children patients or um, even adults works here for a few um, years and then they go back to her, their home country or jump somewhere else. So sometimes we encounter patients who are already uh, wearing ortho K lenses from another uh, practitioner from another country, then they will come here and they want you to continue the care. So um, that's one of the things that hopefully we'll be able to share with you today so that you will know how to do so. And then, um, yeah, and then incorporate orthoteratology in your practice if you are thinking of um, doing uh, something like a specialty uh, lens. So, uh, you know, like uh, how important is ortho -K and how can you incorporate it in your practice now? Okay, so what is orthokeratology? There's a lot of definitions about orthokeratology and there are uh, a lot of um, terminologies, uh, ortho -K, VSD, vision shaping treatment, CRT, so yeah, so um, I took the definition of a British Contact Lens Association in the clear report that was presented last June. Okay, so um, their definition is, uh, as you can see on the screen, it's also known as ortho-K, orthokeratology, and it's a process actually of um, reshaping the anterior part of your cornea. Okay, so when um, you reshape that anterior part of the cornea, as I've mentioned a while ago, it um, temporarily and reversibly reduce the refractive error after lens removal. Okay, so some of uh, the patients, they call it, oh my gosh, it's magic, you know. So yeah, so um, as you can see here at the bottom, so as I've said, um, you know, you have this um, cornea and then when you wear uh, the contact lens or the ortho K, rigid gas permeable lens, um, at night before you go to sleep, when you remove it, it reshapes uh, the anterior part of the cornea. So those patients can see clearly without the aid of eyeglasses and contact lens. So it sounds awesome. So let's see why and how does it happen. Whenever a patient comes in the ITIS room, the thing is when you start doing ortho K, you will learn to explain it your own way, of course. But for me, when a patient comes in my ITIS room, I always uh, uh, tell them to regard this like, um, you know, like retainers for the teeth. Okay, so um, like this. So I don't know if um, any of you are familiar with Invisalign. So uh, a chunk of my patients, they are already having braces or retainers. So I just tell them, actually, this uh, lenses, uh, you can think of it as um, retainers for the eye, but it's made of um, uh, oxygen permeable, uh, rigid gas permeable lenses. And it's safe. You can wear it at night. And then, um, yeah, when you remove it, it reshapes your eye. And I always have a model of an eyeball in my eye test room so that they will understand it properly as I explain it. So is it a new concept? Actually, no. So it started um, in uh, the 60s when it was presented by um, George Chesson. Actually, just to mention to you before it was presented by George Chesson, actually, um, they are saying it was influenced by, um, you know, like uh, the olden times when uh, the ones from Southeast Asia, they used to place um, sandbags over their eye before they go to sleep. I was just telling Kenrick um, a while ago um, in Taiwan, Singapore, Singapore and Hong Kong, there's already 90% short sightedness in uh, the population you see. So um, before they go to sleep, they were they place these um, sandbags over the eye and then when they remove it, their vision is slightly clearer. So, so history-wise, you can say that when you're um, talking to your patients. But um, so uh, facts. 1960s, uh, George Jason presented an ortho -K lens, but it was called orthopocus. Okay, so um, but uh, what he used was um PMMA uh, rigid gas um uh, rigid sorry it's not gas formula but it's PMMA rigid lens okay and then uh, the only thing is the reason why it didn't really um it was not that popular when he uh, presented it it's because um there was a lot of safety issues about it and um it created uh some um uh what's this uh uh astigmatism when the patient wears it and it takes it took a long time before um the patient can win, be weaned off from eyeglasses and contact lenses it takes months and it can only correct um between minus one to minus two of course only one in daytime okay so um it was not it didn't become that famous anymore mainly because of the safety issue issues Okay, so yeah, so 
then this um on my next slide you can see the uh, people or the doctor the people the brands that are responsible for the second generation or okay so um what happened with george jesson what he did he just uh kept on uh, flattening he just uh, flattened the um base curve of uh PMMA lens, okay, and then when he flattened that one, um, it's just, uh, so you know, that's why it kept on either riding high because if it's flatter and, um, you know, it's just flatter than K, and then um, if that happens, there's an induced astigmatism, so the patient's really good, okay, not good. So what happens in the second generation, um, we always tell them um, what we do now in modern also keratology is uh, they created other zones on that specific um, uh, rigid lens. So when they created more and more zones on that rigid lens, what happened, it was able to accommodate and sit on uh, the surface of the cornea better, and it um because of that alignment, it was a it, we, they were able to center the lenses more and more, creating a healthier eye. And of course, uh, they were able to develop uh, a better um type of uh, rigid uh, contact lenses that are uh, more oxygen permeable. Okay, so um, what happens with modern orthokeratology, which is what we use now, so we call it modern orthokeratology, um, you have to um, explain to your patients that it's not, not actually the cornea per se that you're pressing when you're placing that contact lens over the eye. So it's actually um, the most acceptable. There's actually a lot of um, theories behind it, but uh, one of the, if not the most acceptable theory is from um, Helen Swarbrick's uh, uh, research okay so it's um they are saying that uh, so she's, the the group of scientists said that when you place the um contact lens over the eye or the rigid gas um oxygen permeable lens over the eye it's not actually the cornea but it's the tear film that you're um uh, pressing so when you're uh, pressing that tear film it redistributes the epithelial cells and then um when you this redistribute those epithelial cells as you can see here so some of the cells will move to that reverse zone that um, you have created uh, for uh, that shape of your rigid gas permeable and with that it flattens the central part of your cornea so when parallel rays of light um you know come from uh, an infinity um you know strikes on that central curvature of the eye that's um slightly flattened um, they uh, focus directly in front of the retina. Okay, so so yeah, so that's how the vision is corrected. So you have to keep this in mind, okay, that it's not a cornea, it's actually the tear film. Okay, so as I mentioned, it was Helen Swarbrick and her team that, um, uh, you know, the most acceptable uh, theory now that uh, we have in Orthog is because of that, because of that study. Okay, so he, she had, uh, they had this conclusion that um, the corneal epithelial cell layer was the one that's redistributed when you do uh, a flatter um, than K uh, base curve uh, when you design an ortho K lens. Okay. So um, when I started ortho K, the only FDA approval I can quote that time is uh, the 2000 into CRT overnight. So uh, because the thing is, your patients will ask you, oh my gosh, okay, you have to sleep the lenses, uh, you have to wear the lenses before you go to sleep. But I thought it's not allowed, you know, because they all know about the um, soft contact lenses. And then, um, so I have to, when I was starting, I tell them oh, it's FDA approved in 2002. And then um, when I am talking about uh, the ortho-K uh, as a means to control myopia, I have to tell them that as a means of controlling myopia, it's an off-label. It's FDA approved for overnight wear. But that time when I was starting, I was saying like, oh, you know, like it's for overnight, but with regards to controlling myopia, it's off-label. But now we're lucky because as you can see here, um, hopefully I was able to um, place a uh, here uh, as much as I know that um, now there are uh, contact lenses, there are brands now that are approved for overnight 
where as well as um, approved as a myopia management modality. So these are the orthotabrands that are, you know, only approved for overnight. And let's say in May 2019, um, Bloom by Nanicon, it was approved for a myopia management as well, but um, with CE approval. So at the moment, as far as I know, the um, only FDA approved um, overnight wear and myopia management um, orthocalance is the one from Johnson & Johnson called Accuviability, which was approved in May 2021. CE approval at the moment, we have Procornia and Dreamlight as well for myopia management for those of you who are um, doing myopia management in your clinic. So modern orthokeratology, um, when you place a lens in the eye and then, um, you know, you place fluorescein and you shine a uh, blue light or cobalt blue filter, this is what you can see. So we have different parts of the lenses. So I wanted to um, show it to you here um, in conjunction with the movement of the epithelial cells. So we have the uh, base curve of, or the back optic zone dynamic, um, radius, sorry. Radius, and then we have the reverse curve that creates that um, space so that the cells can move somewhere when you, um, you know, flatten the central part of the cornea. So it's around this area here. And then we have the alignment curve. And the alignment curve is where the contact lens sits on your actual cornea. Okay. And then we have the peripheral curve so that you still have, as you know, even with, uh, for those of you who are fitting with um, hard contact lenses or rigid glass permeable, you know, when a patient um, blinks, um, there should be still an exchange of um, tear, tears between the lens and the eye. So that's uh, the peripheral curve here. Okay. Okay. So I face here really curve because there are some orthopay or orthokeratology lenses or brands that has extra zone, okay? So that extra zone is called relief curve just after the reverse curve here in between reverse curve and alignment curve. So, so that just will be familiar, okay? Now, um, orthokeratology, this is what you see in modern orthokeratology, so pre and post treatment. So uh, for um, I would recommend for those who wants to start a uh, fitting ortho-K to um, get in tune and um, have a lecture, you know, like uh, learn more about um, corneal topographies first. Because uh, the thing is, you have to have a very good baseline topography before you can start an ortho -K. Okay, so so that it it's you know like sometimes it's debatable between um optometrists and um you know orthokeratologists and practitioners because in Southeast Asia there are still practitioners of um or orthokeratologists who are doing it uh, without a topographer. But for me personally, it's a must you know to to know about topography, corneal topography, to have a topographer to be able to be successful in uh, fitting orthokey. So anyway, the picture here on the left is um, how it looks like before um, you place the lens in the eye and um, you do follow-ups on the patient. And then once you've placed that orthopay lens on the eye and it reshapes or molds the cornea, this is uh, usually how it looks like. Okay, so here where the red um, area is, is where the cells were um, redistributed and created that steep um, layer. Okay, so who are the patients that, um, you know, like when a patient comes to you in your eye test room and asks you, okay, I heard about this ortho okay, you know, like, um, am I suitable for it? You have to tell the patient not everyone is suitable for ortho okay, okay? So you have to have orthokeratology um, suitability test first. So that's one of the things that you should tell them. Not everyone is suitable for ortho okay. So who are the ones who are suitable? So um, BCLA Clear, as I said last June, they they presented uh, the sort of, you know the criteria. So um, if you can see here with patients motivation here, so yeah, so um, patients motivation is very very important with regards to ortho K lenses. Okay, you have to remember 
these um, lenses, they are rigid cast permeable lenses. I don't know if any of you has ever um, worn one. So I remember when I was a student, um, you know, like I, I've never worn one for um, seeing clear. But as a student, we, we were able to um, place a lens in our eye, rigid cast permeable. And you can, you remember, that's not the most complex comfortable thing right so yeah so um they have to be motivated in this and then of course the chair times the visits that they have to go i mean uh, in um our clinic as well and then um with regards to prescription so um spherical um you can see here for myopia you can give it either full prescription so um you can correct uh, the prescription fully or you can just do partial correction and then um yeah, so whenever somebody talks about orthokay or when somebody asks me about orthokay, they always think that it's only for um, myopic patients. So I just want to um, tell everyone, although there's not much research about it, um, orthokay, it can also be done with hyperopic patients. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, you know, I started doing it and it's not the most it's not the easiest thing to design lens for a um, hyperopic as compared to a myopic patient. Okay, so yeah, but it can be done if um, the patient is suitable for it or if the curvature of the eye is suitable for an orthopedic lens. So you can do it full or partial correction. Astigmatic um, prescription, so those patients who has astigmatism, so there's also um, thoric orthopedic. K lenses, so that's um, possible as well. And then press biopic patients, so uh, patients, um, they you they would want, you know, like if if I were you, I would recommend to start with um if they're already wearing the adults wearing um soft contact lenses to just give them you know like a perspective on how mono vision looks like, so that um you know don't jump you know, into giving them an orthokay um, monovision. So just give them first a perspective on how monovision is, okay, before you um you can do that. But yeah, of course, it's um, um it's uh, suitable as well for um press biopic patients. And then um myopia management, as I mentioned a while ago, it can be used for controlling the elongation of the eyeball, and there are a lot of research that uh, proves so. So um, if we're going to look at FDA approved um, indications, if you're um, uh, going to um, check with a vision shaping treatment, so um, myopia um, less than or equal to minus five, so that's the maximum in the um, FDA approved um, VST. And then the cylinder should be um, equal or um, less than minus 1.50 diopters with the rule. And if you are into um, a CRT or the Paragon CRT uh, lens, um, so the myopia is a minus 6 and below, and then astigmatism of minus 1.75 and below with the rule. Now, according to um, British Contact Lens Association CLEAR study uh, with suitability of myopia, it's um, equal or less than minus 450 with an astigmatism of um, equal or less than minus 3. And then they also incorporated um, uh, pupil size, which is less than or equal to six millimeters. Okay, so um, with the pupils, maybe we'll discuss that one um, later as we go along. Why does pupil size matters when a patient wears an orthokay lens? Okay, and then there's what we call off label. Off label, uh, they are the uh, you know like as you can see here, the approval is uh, you know like let's say between minus four fifty or minus five or minus six. So there are patients who has higher prescription than minus six and are using orthokay lenses and you know are not using eyeglasses or contact lens in daytime. But in this case, you have to explain to your patients before you try to do so or design a lens for them that this is not, uh, there's no FDA approval for it. And then um, consent form is very important in cases where you have off-label. So if you're going to go beyond the parameters of an FDA or CE approved um, prescription, just make sure your patient understands the risk and um, they are going to sign that they understood that this is beyond the acceptable um, approval from um, FDA and CE. So that you have to protect yourself uh, with regards to that. But is it doable beyond minus six weeks? Okay. 
So me personally, the highest prescription um, that I designed Orthocay to is uh, minus 950, but I have colleagues who has designed minus like 10, even, yeah. So um, Orthocay candidates, again, um, of course, you have to be very, very vigilant with the eye health. So um, corneal, uh, this, uh, so the patient has to be free from any corneal dystrophies, diseases, okay? And then, um, yeah, what else? You know, like for example, the thing is the patients when they come to the uh, eye test room, when you take topographies, sometimes some of these patients has, let's say, keratoconus, and then they don't even know that they have it, you know? And then they just want to know if they're suitable for orthopay lens. So you end up discovering, you know, or helping this um, patient. Uh, you know, assessing and diagnosing these patients in, you know, with the, what they have. So, yeah, so um, anyway, so make sure the patients um, with regards to orthopedia are free from this um, dystrophies from the cornea or any um, diseases. Okay. And then, um, as I've mentioned a while ago, they have to be motivated to go either full or partial. Okay. So, partial, just to give you an idea. There are patients um, that the uh, curvature of the eye, let's say a patient who has minus five. So um, two patients who has minus five, one patient can have more curved um, cornea and another patient can have a flatter cornea. So that one with the flatter cornea after computation, you might not be able to, um, you know, after um, computing that you won't be able to achieve uh, the minus 550 or minus 575 because we always have that chestnut factor. Um, extra plus 050, 075. You might, you will not be able to achieve that. So you have to explain to your patient that mm, I'm really very sorry. You have to be honest. I'm really very sorry. I won't be able to correct the full prescription. So um, we will go partial, and you have, will have to wear eyeglasses either, like in the middle of the day or just after removing the lens, depending on what's the um remaining prescription after or the K when. So just be honest with them, and then they should be willing, as I've mentioned. Um, so. UAE or Dubai, it's quite small. So it's easy for me to ask my patients to come in the clinic after one day, three days, one week, you know. But um, in other places, it's not that easy for them to go from um, like two hours, five hours. So make sure they know this frequent visits that they have to do um, going to your um, clinic. And then, of course, they have to be committed in the initial and um, ongoing cost of um, orthopedic lenses. So we can talk about that then later. All of this, actually, all of this um, on this uh, slide, it's all on um, the consent form that uh, I usually ask my patients to sign so that I, you know, I, I um, tell them about it and then they acknowledge that they know about it as well from the start before we start um, dispensing them with the lens. Okay, so um, myopia management, um, as I mentioned, ortho K, it's, uh, it's quite famous actually in um, it, as a modality to control um, myopia. So um, ever since uh, there uh, was that meeting in 2015 in Sydney, we're in our World Health Organization and um, by my own uh, Vision Institute, um, this, you know, like they, they presented you know, the dangers of having, um, you know, the risk of uh, having, you know, um, myopia and what are the risk of having retinal detachment, cataract, uh, glaucoma, macular degeneration. Um, and when uh, we reach, uh, let's say, in 2050, imagine um, they, they forecasted that half of the world population will be short-sighted. And then close to 10% will be um, at risk of having sight threatening condition. So that's a big thing. So so every like a lot of uh, practitioners honestly in 2015 um, had this awareness that oh my gosh okay it's time for us to um, be aware of uh, myopia and it's not just about just giving eyeglasses or normal contact lens and that's it. Okay so so. Um, yeah, so learning about ortho K, you, can, you will be able to, you know, you feel that sense of responsibility with this myopic uh, patients. Um, for those of you who are, are um, dealing with um, myopic uh, children, 
or doing myopia management in your clinic. I don't know if it's similar with uh, you and what we encounter in our clinic because for me, what I notice is that the children nowadays, they have higher myopia than their parents. Okay, so yeah, so um, that's quite alarming because not only they have the um, genetic uh, factor, but they now have the environmental factor as well. So yeah, so um, or the case that mentions being used as one of the modalities to control myopia. Okay, so to um, just to give you a summary for uh, who are the candidates for it, uh, those are uh, sporty. Okay, so they don't want to wear their eyeglasses or contact lens in daytime um, when they do their sports, especially water sports. Because as you know, when the, uh, the patients are wearing self-contact lenses and water goes in the eye, what happens is that, um, you know, they are at high, high risk of having, um, let's say, a cantaniba or a microbial keratins. So, yeah, so um, they are most um, the ones that are um, coming to you to ask about it okay and then um, myopic children as i mentioned a while ago or myopic patients who are in developmental stage who are at risk of having like high numbers in their um, later age and then um of course for orthopedic candidates we have to make sure that our patients will be compliant so i've um, sometimes you know i don't know if you've experienced it but you will get a shock so i've had one patient whom one patient whom I asked um, where is uh, his contact lens and he took it out from his mouth from this is in her cheek. This was in the 90s. So, you know, like there are patients who are non-compliant like that. Okay, so yeah, so you have to make sure your patients will be compliant. So, um, pre-fitting examination. So, what are the important things to do? Let's say, okay, now I know that my patient is, um okay, ready for ortho -K prescription within the FDA or CP, CE or um, BCLA clear approval, free of corneal dystrophy. I want to start orthopay for this patient now. So what am I supposed to do as an optom? So first, when they come in your ITIS room, we check for uncorrected visual acuity. And then we do dry and um, wet refraction. Okay, so for for those patients or the for the children patients or um you know those whom you're going to do myopia management, um you have to do cyclo, so cyclo is a must, cyclo cyclophagic refraction. And then um you have to get their best corrected VA or visual acuity. Why? Because when you're already starting your orthopay treatment and then um, you know, you're expecting a six over six uh, vision and then only to find out that on your preliminary or your colleague's preliminary test, this patient is never reaching six over six anyway, you know, so yeah, so, so it means that your expectation is not from what was, uh, what were you getting from your initial test, you know what I mean, so you don't want to get lost um, in the middle of the treatment, okay, thinking that it's not working only to find out that during the, um, you know, pre-fitting, it was already suboptimal vision, so that one. And then um, binocular vision tests are very important as well, of course. And then um, horizontal visible iris diameter because you determining the size of uh, the lens that you're going to order will depend on, on your HVID. Pupil size because once you um, start that treatment, you know, you have to um, uh, check if you have to explain to your patients if they're going to see halos or glares when they start wearing their um, orthopay lenses or if it will, if it's a possible problem if um, they start wearing one, okay, depending on your treatment. So, okay, and then baseline topography, um, yeah, I cannot uh, stress that enough that uh, ordering your first lens, it you have to have a very good uh, baseline topography, okay? So um, this is uh, here, this is uh, the machine that I use. So ever since I started um, uh, practicing and designing ortho uh, lenses, I use uh, this machine. So I, I'm a bit old school. That's why I'm, you know, getting stressed if I'm thinking of, oh my gosh, what will happen? You know, my anxiety shoots up. And I'm thinking, what will happen if there will be no other machine? So this one, uh, I've been using it uh, for years. And the thing is, uh, I like this handheld one because even the young kids who cannot sit 
on uh you know on in front of a machine and they cannot like face their chin and their forehead they keep on moving and doing all of those things and you cannot capture a good um topographical um photo or shape of the anterior part of the eye this one this handheld one i use it's called scout if you're interested the scout um character um even if they're moving uh, you know you can just um, move the machine because it's handheld so i like that one so you have to have a very very good baseline topography okay so um this is one of the captures that i was able to get obviously that's not a good <laughs> it's just cute because um it's smiling at me but obviously that's not a good photo to start with if you're going to design an orthopay lens or order an orthopay lens because uh some of the um orthopay lenses you can take a picture and give uh, the refraction and the um corneal topography to the lab and they will design it for you so yeah so they will ask you if you send this to them they will ask you to um take another picture a better one okay so yeah so you have to have um, a nice corneal topographical uh, photo to be able to design and start with your ordering your first lens okay so this is an example of a patient who came to the eye test room and then wanting to know if he is suitable for orthopedic lenses actually this patient already know that that um Keratoconus or irregular cornea, but you know, he didn't know much about orthopay, so he thought he can use it. So, yeah, um, you have to be very, very big in eye height. Okay, so, um, check uh, for slit lamp anterior, as I've said, um, you know, check for the anterior eye health, of course, posterior as well. Check for the um, uh, pressures of the eye, okay, because the things that you know. Myopia, as it gets higher, there's higher risk of having um, glaucoma as well. So at least you have that baseline and then it's your length. So um, in our clinic, so there's sometimes there's debate about this, how important it uh, checking for extra length is in myopia management. Okay, but for us in our clinic, um, even if a patient is not myopic, to tell you the truth, so even if a patient is still hyperopic, even if a child is still hyperopic, we still check for um the length of the eyeball. We still do um a chair length measurement. So for me, it's just a good indicator when the patient comes back after three months if uh, the myopia is controlled, apart from checking the vision, if there's still an elongation of the um chair length. If I have to do combination with my orthopay lens with another modality such as atropine. Okay. Consent form, as I was mentioning again and again and again, I want to stress on this one. So what should be in your consent form? So um, we have a consent form in the clinic. So if you want uh, through uh, the world of optometry, I can uh, share it with you so that you can uh, use it as a guide when you want to start orthopedic practice. So what's in it? Um, you know, just a brief uh, summary. It should have your Fitting fee, and then if you don't want to do any reforms, um, depending on your, um, you know, like if it's a one year treatment, six month treatment, so you have to place there as well. Most of the things that you explain to the patient before they start the orthopay, if you're thinking of doing exchange policies, what's under it, and then um, benefits versus risk, uh, risk mainly, and then um, they should confirm by the um, name signature and the date that they confirm you know this is more on protection for you and where you're working okay and then um you have also the insertion removal confirmation um so with me um when my patient starts up until day one uh they have already signed three consent forms okay so one the main one for orthopay and then um Second is when um, I dispense the lens to them and then the next day when I, they clean the lenses. So you have to be a bit OCD on this one to protect yourself and the clinic you're working uh, with. Okay. And then for me, uh, witness is important as well. You know, apart from you and the patient, you always get a witness from the clinic. Okay. So that um, you're safe. Okay. General fitting process. Okay. So the first lens. Um, some of the orthopay lenses that's available in the market, they have trial lenses, okay? So they have diagnostic um, trial lenses that you can already place on a patient's eye right there and then. 
And then um, for me, I started uh, designing my lens. My very first orthopedist lens is a custom design lens. So I honestly was not able to go through uh, a fitting of orthopedic with a di using a diagnostic lens. So I started with taking um, corneal topography and designing from the corneal topography that I got. It's kind of like custom design clothes rather than ready to wear clothes. So yeah, so you can do so. So as I said, in Southeast Asia, some of my colleagues, um, the laboratory only asks them to give um, keratometric reading. So not even a picture of a corneal topography, but, uh, you know, using their uh, keratometers. But as you know, it only captures um, central three millimeters of the cornea. But um, then again, uh, apparently, the laboratories can design a lens for them. So as long as the eyes are healthy and it's working, it's, you know, to each his own. Okay. So um, for the first lens, I just want to present a fitting uh, set versus empirical. Empirical is what, what I do. So um, uh, pros and cons. So at least in the fitting set, you have the initial trial lens possible. Because for me, once I take a picture and design a lens, of course, it takes uh, around um, one and a half to two weeks for the lens to arrive, for the initial lens to arrive. So if you have a fitting lens with you, which it's very handy because at least you can already show the patients um, uh, the difference, you know, the difference when you um, place an orthopedic and let them close their eyes depends on the practice. Some of the practices, they do it for 30 minutes, some for two hours. Okay, and then automatic, you know, the patient will already see a difference with their vision and it's a good thing to show them, you know. So they will be motivated even with that uncomfortable feeling. And then um, for the fitting set, it's very important for a fluorescein assessment. Okay, so for them, they, they assess um, an open eye situation with their ortho lens. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so that's a big thing for them. And then um, another thing is that um, the supplier can provide free lenses all at the same time so that um, if you place a lens on the eye um, with this and then um, you feel that it's not um, optimal as well, how you want it to be on a patient's eye with a fluorescent, you have uh, the flatter and the steeper curve available for you on that day. Okay. Whereas, um, for example, for what I do, when the lens arrives, you assess it there, um, you ask them to come the next day, and then that's the only time you will know if um, it's a good lens or sometimes you have to wait for a week or so. The only thing is, I just want to go back to that slide. The only thing why, so why why are you still custom designing if it, it looks like it's better with a fitting set? To tell you the truth, um, it's easier for me for custom designing because I have better control. I don't know if I'm just a control freak, but um, you know what I mean. So when I take a picture, I design um, eight points on the cornea. So when um, a lens is not working as how I want it to be, I know why, you know, so it's easier for me to troubleshoot. So maybe it depends on how you started your orthopedic practice and um, which lens did you start it with. So I'm, I'm happier and more comfortable doing my own troubleshooting than asking a lot to troubleshoot it for me. So yeah, so eye health is very important. Uh, so what happens when you have already that um, lens uh, that you have, whether you're going to use uh, the inventory diagnostic set or something that you ordered from the laboratory that you designed yourself, okay, first thing that you do is to check for the eye health of the patient. But those, I only checked that patient one week, one and a half week ago. The cornea is amazing, okay, so even at that, there's a lot of things that can happen between one week, one and a half, or two weeks, yeah? So always, always start with checking the eye health of the patient before you stick that first lens in the eye, okay? One of the things that I didn't write here that I checked as well is the um, visual acuity, unaided visual acuity, okay? So I check for unaided visual acuity first, and then check for the eye health, and then I insert the lens in the eye. So here on my slide, I place saline. So saline, I use 0.9% sodium chloride because I uh, fit uh, scleral lenses as well, so I can use on both. But there are times when my patient says, um, high myo is a high myope or higher prescription, I end up using um, 
either a lubricant or a mix of saline and lubricant before inserting the lens in the eye. Um, for those of you who has experience with um, fitting uh, scleral lenses, kind of like when you fit scleral lenses, so you fill it up with the liquid, either saline, saline or lubricant or just lubricant. And then I usually dip my fluorescein, the stick of my fluorescein um, there to make it green and then place it in my patient's eye. Okay, um, Place the ortho lens on my patient's eye before I assess it over a slit lamp uh, with cobalt blue filter. Okay, so I make sure there's no bubbles in between the lens and the eye because you have to remember there's a groove, the reverse curve, there's a groove on your contact lens. So there, there can be air pockets there. So I want to make sure there's none. So if there is, I remove it again and place it back in with a full liquid. So the shaper um, or the ortho K lens should be moving approximately one millimeter. Some of my colleagues, it's debatable. Some of my colleagues want some two millimeter movement, two millimeters movement once the lens is in when they're assessing it with eyes open through a slit lamp. But for me, one millimeter with the lens that I am fitting, okay? Upon blinking. So um, these are two examples um, of ortho K lens on eye. So as you can see here on the picture on the left eye, it's smaller than the horizontal visible iris diameter, which is the most common ortho K lens um, that we get in the market. And then um, the one on the right is one of the lens that I uh, designed. It's uh, larger than um, horizontal visible iris diameter. So because it, when you do um, custom designing, uh, you can order, um, you know, like bigger than the horizontal visible iris diameter. So just to give you an idea, I usually order um, larger than HPID if my patient has um, high myo. Like for example, when I design for let's say minus 9.50. So I want it to, you know, like to just be central and uh, to share that, um, you know, bearing um, on the sclera as well apart from the cornea. So I find it more effective for me. Um, so yeah, so so it's doable as well. But of course, this one is uh, off label, as we call it. Okay, so this is the um, example of the one I was telling you when you place the lens in and there's not enough liquid, there's not enough saline, lubricant, or mix of both. Uh, before inserting the lens, then you end up having that uh, big bubble on your reverse curve. So it's okay. Okay, don't panic. Okay, it's uh, not something that uh, is emergency. All you have to do is remove the lens and then tilt up and then reinsert it. So now, so um, the last time that uh, I gave a lecture and um, a workshop for ortho K, there was um, a lot of questions and debate about it. Okay, so um, once I place that ortho K lens in the eye, okay, uh, so saline, and then I assess it in the slit lamp. Okay, fine, good fitting. I am um, in our clinic. We actually have a bed. Okay. So uh, we ask the patients to sleep in the clinic for two hours. Okay. So yeah, so um, after two hours, that's when we, uh, we check how the uh, eye health looks like. Okay. So yeah, so um, I would say most of my colleagues do not do this. Okay. So they don't feel the need to do it. But because um, when we started, uh, you know, uh, our orthopedic practice, in the clinic, we are, you know, we feel that we will be able to see um, more um, if it's um, health for the eyes and all of those things. Um, if we leave it for two hours, that's one second. If we leave it um, with under our watch for two hours, uh, what happens? I don't know if you know about REM. So when a patient sleeps, it's up until two hours that they start to have, um, you know, like um, one and a half, sorry, one and a half hour before they start REM. So REM, the eyes will move, yeah, depending on the eye. And then um, at least when the eye moves, we kind of know where the lens settles. So that's one of the reasons for as well. But the main, main reason is um, mainly for eye health, okay? So after two hours, we wake up our patient and we place a lubricant in the eye before removing the lens. Of course, we don't force it. Make sure it's moving before you remove the lens. 
then we check for um visual activity. So this is fun because um most often than not, even if it's just two hours, uh, the patients or the parents of the patients, if you're dealing with children, they can already see a slight difference with the uh, um vision. Okay, so that's exciting for for um everyone. So yeah, and then you can do your refraction as well, depending if you have um slight erosions on the cornea, acceptable erosions. So of course, it's not to um you know like when you do your refraction, it kind of got some fines, or if you have a like orange peel appearance. So it depends on what shows up on your um slit now check. So as I've mentioned, um when you just remove your uh, shaper or ortho lens, there can be erosions on your cornea. Okay, so when you have um, erosions on your cornea, don't get nervous. Okay, so yeah, oh my gosh, there's erosions. Um, this is a bad lens. Okay, so if you see erosions on the cornea, it's not always a bad thing. Okay, so it can happen, but you have to know when to change and when to keep that lens. Okay, so for me, for me, um, what we do in the clinic, uh, we depend on, um, because we started like this, even before um, orthopedic practice, uh, we have the CCLRU guide in the clinic. So, you know, at least if you say like grade one, two, three, everyone in the clinic knows what you meant, okay? So um, I would advise to use just a single, uh, you know, guide. You know, don't mix like, for example, practitioner A is using Efron and then practitioner B is using um, CCLRU. So it can be confusing. So, yeah, so if you're going to use one modality, uh, uh, sorry, um, one guide for your erosions, um, just make sure, or, or I help, make sure you use uh, just one for the whole clinic. So for me, when I see um, erosions that's um, grade 1 or 1.5 or even 2, um, I'm fine. I accept that one. If it's grade two, I ask them to come after. Um, if this is after day one, I ask them to come after two to three days just to make sure. But if it's just grade one, I ask them to come back after three days. So this is a study that was done by um Patrick um Patrick Caroline and um uh, Mark um Andre. And then um as you can see here, there's a picture on the left and the right. So this is the one I was talking about. Don't panic if you see erosions on the um, you know, uh, anterior part of the cornea. As long as you know how to assess which grade is it. If it's grade 3 and 4, forget it. Just redesign a lens because um, don't wait for morning 3 before you reassess because that lens is just too flat for the cornea of your patient. But if for me, if I get um, grade 1 or 2 in the CCLRU, I'm fine. I'll ask the patient to come back after um, day 3. So as you can see here, morning 1, it looks like it's a heavy staining. But after 3 days of using the exact same lens, it's, it's cleared up. Okay. So um, these are orange peel appearance that can happen on your day 1. So when you ask the patients to come back after 1 day of using like on overnight so after so after two hours you dispense right then you teach them how to clean the lens you ask them to come back the next day and then you see this on the cornea so don't panic this just means that um when they slept with the lens some of the liquid went out of that contact lens in between the um lens and the anterior part of the cornea so um there were bubbles that were formed in between the lens and the eye so that's okay um, that will just clear up within like 3 hours to 24 hours. That's fine. You can ask them to continue with the lens. So this one on the left, a similar situation. But I will ask this patient, instead of asking the patient to come back after one week like this patient, this patient I will ask to come back after three days. Because this one, okay, although it's not too alarming for me, but it seems a bit on the heavier side with erosion. So I just want to make sure that um that one will not create any problems with my patients I have. So yeah, these are some of the um topographers that are available and um you know uh, you can use in the clinic. So we have the shine frog ones and then we have the MedMod, which is quite um famous in um orthopedic practice um at the moment. And then we have the OCD scan as well and then the scalp as I mentioned a while ago. Now, 
when you remove that lens, okay, so after two hours of sleeping in your clinic, after one day, like the next day when they come in your eye test room, and after one week, you will see the difference as the um, ortho K lens molds on the cornea, okay? So you do not assess uh, if the, the lens is amazing or is working really well after two hours, after one day, or sometimes even after one week. There are times I need to wait until 14 days before I will know if I need to, um, you know, increase a treatment or, or do something about uh, the first lens that I ordered. So don't jump into ordering um, at once if you see that um, your, your result is suboptimal because uh, you have to remember that lens will still mold. Okay. So as you can see here, after two hours of sleeping in the clinic, there's two rings. So we have double rings. So don't panic if it's like that. See, it's starting to mold into one, and then after one, it is better. Although having said that, you see this case, there's still a central island, or there's still um, less flattening on the central part. So with this patient, I would wait for um, one more week and see if it's um, good. Okay, so this is the ideal uh, corneal topography that we get after 14 days of using um, an ortho -K lens. So this patient is a happy patient, can see well on your chart. When you do refraction, depending on which day, uh, or which, sorry, which hour or how many hours um, did you do the refraction after the patient removed the lens, because of course there's a regression as uh, the hours pass by within the day. So most often than not, if you get this um, bullseye pattern, um, this patient is happy and um, I have is good uh, I if uh, I have is perfect okay so we have what we call smiley face okay so let's say after seven or 14 days when you take a picture of the um, cornea or even you know like after three days you took a picture if you know that um corneal topography it tells a lot of stories because when the eyes are open it's different story but when the eyes are closed, you don't know what's happening under that um, closed uh, uh, lid, uh, you know, closed lid um, interaction between the lens and the eye and the shaping. Okay, so yeah, so with this patient, a smiley face, um, we call it smiley face because uh, you see there's like a smile here when the lens is riding high, when the patient is asleep. Okay, so when the lens is riding high, like this when the patient is asleep okay what can be the cause it can be that the lens is too loose or sometimes um you know the um, um you know when you compute for your adjustment uh, what happens the base curve is too flat okay so when it's too flat just like with your normal um rigid contact lens rigid contact lenses even when lens are open when it's too flat it rides higher yeah? So um, it's similar to this. So the solution is just to tighten the alignment curves. Okay, frowny face. Okay, I was trying to find uh, in um, the patients that I uh, took topographies of my orthopedic patients, a uh, very, very good example of a frowny face, but um, it's kind of hard for me to find one. But um, frowny face is just the opposite of a smiley face. So instead, so when the patient goes to sleep and they wake up, they remove, you take um, topographies, you know what's happening under that lid when you take a picture and um, the uh, lens, you know, when the eyes are closed, is the centering um, inferiorly. So when it's the centering inferiorly, it creates that, um, you know, that uh, curvature looking like a frown face. Okay. So in this patient, as you can see, it's both lateral decentration or the lens was the centering um, out and down as well. So just the opposite of a smiley face, what can be the reason for it? So it's either the lens is too tight, due to a, a flatter apex and to periphery of the cornea or the sagittal, um, the uh, height of the cornea. So the, the a solution is to loosen the alignment curve or reduce the diameter. Central island, I mentioned this a while ago. So um, what can cause this uh, if there's not enough um, treatment here? So that can cause that or um, it hasn't molded uh, full yet. Okay, so it's just starting to mold. It hasn't, um, you know, uh, moved the um, 
epithelial cells from center to this area here yet, so that can cause central island. Another cause of central island is um, you have a very steep um, uh, back optic zone uh, radius. Okay, so if you have a steep uh, back optic zone radius, that can cause central island as well. Or if you have really tight um, alignment curve, like that should just be sitting on that cornea on this area, just outside this reverse curve, it will lift the um, central part of the lens and that can create um, central island as well. So um, sometimes uh, we have to be patient. Okay, so like for this example, you see there's a central island in the middle, but after uh, seven, actually this uh, one week more, I asked the patient to come back after one week. And as you can see here, it flattened in the middle without changing the lens. Okay. So yeah, so um, so yeah, so the solution is to just flatten the fitting curve. Uh, oh yeah, so with um central island, what you will notice as well when you do when you check for uh, visual acuity, when you do refraction, you're not reaching six of over six. It's always suboptimal vision with these patients. Okay, so that's one of the indicators that even before you pick your topograph. Uh, topographer and um, take pictures you kind of already have an idea that um, there can be central island um, corneal topography. Okay. Another reason why you can get a central island uh, photo from your um, topographer is when there's a lot of erosions on the anterior part of the eye of your patient. So yeah, so if there's a lot of erosions, if that's let's say grade two, three, four, you know, so um, of course, do not flatten the um, base curve of your ortho more because if you flatten it more, the more that it will create problems. So it's not, you know, so yeah, it's case to case for central island. Make sure you know why is there a central island. Lateral decentration, most often than not, this is caused by um, small lens. So if you're, if, you know, I told you a while ago, um, getting the horizontal visible iris diameter is very important. So if um, your lens is too small, then um, it will move um, laterally okay, so towards the left center. Okay, so what to do? Just increase the diameter. With a solution, your lab is your best friend because it depends on the type of lens that you're using. So it depends on the manufacturer of the lens with regards to troubleshooting. So this one is just uh, what I do when I um, design my lenses. Okay? So with you, if you're going to start, let's say, with CRT lens, it will depend on um, the tires and CRT people. So you have to defend your laboratory and the people in it. Okay? Don't fight with them. They are your best friends, especially when you're um, starting your orthopedic. Because you have to remember, they know better than you, okay, at this point. So make sure, um, and usually they are super nice, the laboratory. The people in the lab, they are so supportive and nice. So, um, yeah, so they will guide you along the way. Orthopedic survival kit. What do our patient need once they start using the orthopedic? What are we going to give them so that um, they will be successful orthopedic wearers? So, on the day, uh, remember I asked the patient to sleep in the clinic for two hours, right? So you wake them up, you remove the lens, check the vision, check the eye health, um, topography, everything is perfect. So what I do, um, I ask them, I teach them to insert, how to insert and remove the lens. So insertion removal, okay? So this is the brand that I use uh, to insert the lens. This is the saline that I use. And then um, I give them, um, you know, pointers, you know, a list of what to do. It's actually an email that I gave to one of the parents when I was, um, in the, you know, starting my orthopedic. And because it's verbatim, it's nice to give to the patient so that they can follow. I even place there the brands. Okay, so for example, um, hold the lens on your uh, finger, place Tony Mar open close parenthesis saline you know it's like proper verb but then so that they won't um you know they won't make a mistake let's say and then on the first day when they're if on the first uh, night that they're going to use the lens i only give them multi-purpose solution okay on on that day okay why because i don't want to fog up their brain 
the most important thing for me on the first day when I dispense that lens is for them to be able to insert that lens that night, okay? Because I'm going to see them the next day anyway, okay? So yeah, so I just want them to insert that lens in the eye. Why do I give them a multi-purpose solution? So that just in case the lens falls on the table, on the floor, on their lap, at least they have something to clean it with before they insert in the eye again. Okay, so this, uh, so I have a big, I give them a big and a small um, DMV inserter and remover. Why? Why do I have the big one? Just in case, I only give the big one, I cut it at the bottom. Just in case the um, patients are having a hard time balancing the lens on their finger when they fill it up with a saline or lubricant, okay? So it keeps on falling off their finger. At least they have something to hold the lens on. But of course, the lesser the accessories, the better because they are having a um, lesser risk of infection. And I give them a mirror as well. Okay, I engrave their name. So it's something that I love doing. So you can give them that as well. Okay, so next day, I ask them to come with the lens on. Again, controversy and debate between um, orthokeratologists. So some orthokeratologists, um, they ask the patients to come with the lens off. Okay, so for me, I was um, not fighting for it, but I was really um, telling uh, uh, the other practitioners, no, I will ask the patients to come with the lens on with the lens on. Why? I want to be the first one to remove the lens and check how the eye health looks like. Okay. So yes, I want to come. Maybe because it's easier for me living here because it's not too big. You know, they can easily come with the lens on. If it's children, mommy can hold their hand. But most often than not, um, even if the lens is not that comfortable, most of the patients are compliant. I can count with my hands with so many orthopedic I have. Um, I can count in my hands those who came with the lens off. It's just that uh, sometimes when they wake up, one lens already popped out or something, you know. But yeah, most often than not, they come with the lens on. So this one, um, when they come with the lens on, again, I check for eye health, topography, and uh, vision. So I give them on that day, that's the time that I teach them how to clean their lenses with the solutions that they are going to use from then onwards. At least I didn't fog up their brain when they slept in the clinic the first time I dispense it. Okay, so this is very important now because this will give us um, less risk of having problems with eye health. So this one, I, I give them um, either Ote Cleaner or Boston Cleaner. So after removing the lens, I place it on the palm, place one drop of Ote Cleaner or Boston Cleaner. I always ask them to use their ring finger in cleaning the lens because it's our weakest finger. And then rinse it with a saline again. And then I always ask them to use um, the 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide-based solution for cleaning their lenses. And every six months, I ask them to progen the lenses that they have. Okay. Now, this is an example of a non-compliant patient who just after wearing the lens for three months, I don't know if you can see here. I'm sure you can see, not unless you need eyeglasses or maybe ortho okay. <laughs> You can see here how murky, you know, that area where the reverse stone is. So if you already have that murky area there, for sure, when that patient wears the lens, where will the cell move and redistribute if there's no more space there, right? So what happened to this patient? Mm, after three months, it's not working. Doctor, just this ortho okay, it's starting to get blurry again. Maybe my vision's becoming, uh, my myopia's becoming worse. Only to find out it's so um, dirty. So this patient has stopped um, using his, uh, his uh, Boston cleaner in cleaning the lens. So yeah. So what did we do? Um, we progented uh, the lens even if it's uh, just three months. This is not the lens. I cannot find the after picture of that lens. So yeah, before this lecture. So I just want to show you the power of progen. Um, this is not sponsored by Manicon, but I just want to um, inform you that it's a really, really very good solution to just clean that um, surface. Okay, so we soak it for 30 minutes with a progen AMD and oh, clear again. So yeah, so follow up. So okay. okay. 
हेलो हेलो so yeah so um sorry so what happened so after sleeping for two hours uh check the eye health then day one check the eye health and then teach them how to clean their lenses from then onwards then what so after day one i asked the patients to come back after um seven days and then um after uh so seven days or one week one month every three months thereafter until one year Okay, so it's up to you if you want to place your ortho uh, treatment in a package. So for us, it's easier to do it in a package because it covers up until that one year. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so there are times I ask the patients to come back on more than those visits because, uh, for example, as you can see, if there's a decentration, okay, lateral or um, smiley frown, then I have to ask them to come back um, um, with more visits. So you have to account for those visits, okay, for these patients. So yeah, so day one, one week, one month, every three months thereafter until one year. After one year, they graduate. I only see them every six months. And then, uh, yeah, it depends. If um, I'm doing myopia management, I still see them on um, everything. It's just to check for the HR elongation. Okay, so most of, often, I think I'm lucky because my patients are compliant. Okay, so on follow-ups, um, one week, 14 days, one month, what do you do? So um, visual activity, topography, HR length, refraction, and um, eye health. Oh, yeah. By the way, after one year, check again for binocular vision and, um, you know, like the annual check. Like, think of them like you're doing your annual check on them. So, benefits versus risks. Uh, we already know that uh, the benefits of um, this contact lenses. What is it? Uh, so, uh, you're free from eye, the patients are free from eyeglasses and contact lenses in daytime, good for sports, um, controlling myopia, okay, so um, less risk of having more dry eyes with the wear of um, soft contact lens in daytime and the um, wearing of the mask. And then, um, yeah, so what are the risks? Um, of course, microbial keratitis. So that's why I do my teach for cleaning the lenses on day one because I have to make sure I have their full attention because um of course these are side threatening uh, problems yeah so according to the BCLA clear uh, the most common uh, microbial keratitis seen on those patients who had um uh, who was using ortho K is um pseudomonas so um the pseudomonas they found in Actually, the microbial keratitis is related to orthopedic wear. Um, 80% of them are uh, found in um, East Asia. Okay, so actually, I was asking um, kind of, uh, uh, before the session started, uh, where are our delegates coming from? They <laughs> said it's mostly from East. So yeah, so 80% of the uh, micro microbial keratitis uh, um, due to orthopedic uh, where lens wear uh, is seen in um, East Asia. And then, um, to quote it right, 52% of uh, that the keratitis uh, found is uh, due to pseudomonas. And then, uh, the 30% of the cases is um, due to acantaniba. So that's the risk. That's why you have to make sure that your patient understands the cleaning process, okay? And what does it entail if they're not going to follow? Another thing that we found out about microbial keratitis is mostly females that are affected um, more than uh, males that had uh, the infection using this um, lens. Okay, so um, I would like to recommend everyone to uh, join uh, British Contact Lens Association. So um, you can um, check their website because there's a lot, like for me, even for me personally, I really grew as a practitioner and, and uh, you know, as an accomplice and as a contact lens practitioner, I learned a lot when I started joining um, BCLA. 
and then everyone i can say everyone there's not one person who's not supportive in that team so um i don't know if you're familiar with the book okay so so this one um you know they they gave it to uh, those who uh, joined uh, BCLA, but uh, you can access this for free as well. So it's um, the uh, BCLA Clear, so um, Contact and Evidence-Based um, Academic Report. And then um, the paper four is about ortho but apart from ortho it encompasses anterior eye as well, scleral lenses, and um, contact lens related um, uh, in anterior eye. Okay. So I can only say as much in this lecture, you see. So if you um, check out uh, the BCLA clear, you will learn way more than um, what I uh, explained for today. So you always have to remember when it can't be done, do it. If you don't do it, it means it doesn't exist. So these are some of the photos of my patients whom I've been seeing since they were eight years old. And now they're going to uni, so 18, 19, and saying goodbye to me because um, Dubai is very transient. So some of them moving back to their home country, some of them, um, you know, like, uh, yeah, pandemic happened. So yeah, so they, they, I'm not the tallest person, obviously. So yeah, so it's it's very rewarding when you uh, practice ortho -key. So these are the references, and then um yeah. So if if you have any questions, I hope that you learned from our session today. And then if you have any questions, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow! Thank you very much for that informative and exciting presentation, Dr. Rogan. You have um, covered a very good topic today and have given us some wonderful insights that I'm sure we could take away. I would now pass us over to Samuel, who will just be conducting a short Q&A session for some of the questions. Samuel? We have some questions which have been submitted by us and these. And with the permission, I would like to put those questions to your face. Okay, one of the questions is, does um, Autokeratology affects the color and contrast sensitivity. Okay, so um, actually, there's a lot of um studies that was made about aberration. Okay, so contrast sensitivity. Um, in our clinic, I I started to learn about it when a patient has a cataract, and then for those who have um pre and post LASIK. So similar to um a patient who has uh, who had LASIK. Okay, so it's affected as well with regards to contrast sensitivity. Okay, um, what uh, I know, as far as I know, is that as the prescription gets higher, you know, because um, ortho is also based on Munerlin's formula, so the treatment zone gets smaller and smaller. There are more aberrations, and the um, contrast sensitivity gets a bit on the worse side as well. So I think, thanks for the question, whoever asked that one. Because I think you have to discuss this with your um, patients as well. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Uh, the second question: Could the other keratology lenses help in the management of keratoconus? No. Okay. So yeah. So um, one of the slides that um I showed a while ago is about corneal dystrophies. Okay, so yeah, so and then one of the slides I showed a while ago is a patient who came in and wants to have ortho K lenses. And then, um, yeah, as you saw in that uh, corneal topography, the patient has keratoconus. So um, having said that, because um, half of my lungs breathes um, itis for irregular corneas, so when you catch those patients, you tell them, I'm really very sorry. I won't be able to do ortho -K lenses on you. But let me help you by designing, let's say, a sclera lens or a rigid glass permeable to um, make you see better than your eye glass and your normal contact lens. Okay, And then if they need a cross-linking, you are able to catch them at that stage. Thank you. One more question, please. How much time is needed to adapt to auto lenses? And what kind of solution is used for auto lenses? Sorry? Can you please repeat the question? 
All right, how much time is needed to adapt to auto -care lenses? And what kind of solution is used for the auto -care lenses? Okay, so how much time? So uh, for me, it depends on um, how uh, soft or hard the corneas are. I have patients who surprise me. Okay, so let's say I have two patients, uh, they're both minus two. Uh, one of those patients, what can happen the next day when they come in the clinic, I remove the contact lens, they zoom to 6 over 6 or 20, 20. Whereas I have this other patient who has minus 2 as well, but it takes one week before the vision is clear. Okay. Of course, as the prescription gets higher, it takes around when I promise the patients or I really promise. Sorry. So when I tell the patient, OK, they ask me, when will I like get rid of my eyeglasses? I tell them it takes around one to two weeks. Are we OK? Yeah. So, yeah, it takes. Sorry. <laughs> I got distracted. So yeah, it takes around um one to two weeks before the vision is um optimal as per what I designed. And then I always tell them um after one week, this lenses has warranty, you see. So it depends on your manufacturer. So for me, the lenses I order, um, it's under warranty. So I tell them just in case that it's not as optimal as I want it to be. After two weeks, I can redesign the lens and order it under warranty. So I think you, it's better to have that a relationship with your laboratory because at the end of the day, nobody's perfect. So if you're going to tell the patient how many days, tell them a oh, one to two weeks, maximum two weeks. Um, I just want to segue on that question because I forgot um, to um, include it in my lecture. Uh, the thing is, some of the uh, optometrists or even the patients, they are asking me before they start the ortho, okay, so what will I do? Because their eyeglasses, let's say a patient who has minus five, of course, after day one, they're not minus five anymore. And they're not a uh, plan as well. They're not plus 0 0.75 as well. So what will they use, right? So they can't see still. Their vision still suboptimal. So, uh, we are lucky to have daily disposable lenses in our clinic. So what I do, I bridge them with um, daily disposable lenses with receding power so that they can see just after removing the lens until I see them again after one week. You know, that's actually one of the questions that optometrists always ask me. What will the patients do? They can't see from day one if they have minus five. You know, their eyeglass will be too strong. So, yeah. So, if you have access to daily disposable, um, better. Thank you so much for answering those questions. But unfortunately, in the interest of time, we may not have other questions. Please, if you don't have any further questions that would like to be answered, you can email them directly to the email address which is displayed on the screen right now. And I'm sure we will endeavor to get back to you as quickly as we can. I want to hand you over to Dr. King. Okay, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much again, Dr. Josie Reed. And thank you again to our attendees. We can see definitely from the presentation today, um, this really is an area of expertise for her. And even in terms of her experience, you can see it as well. Um, so as we close up today, your thoughts are very important to us. And we will be sending you an email for you to fill out and then also to submit a short feedback survey to complete for the certificate of attendance and to guide us as well in future presentation topics. The next World of Optometry webinar will be on August the 14th and this will be by Dr. Ubi Malupe and he will be doing advanced business strategies for optometrists. So once again, guys, I'm bringing today's presentation to a close. I wish you all a very good day. Take care.